I hope yesterday was a blessing to you and that you were able to meditate a little bit on God's word. Today we are looking at John chapter 2 verses 1 through 11 where we are focusing in on the words that Jesus says. Stay tuned. Hey friends, welcome to the Hearing Jesus Podcast. I'm your host, Rachel Grohl, missionary, author, pastor, and life coach. I know sometimes you doubt if you are truly hearing God's voice or if it's really your own. I know that you are praying for a way to know the difference and to be confident in your relationship with God and what He says in His Word. If you are ready to grow in your faith and your identity in Christ and to confidently step into the calling God has for you, then join me as we dig deep into God's Word so you can learn to live out your faith in your everyday life. Hey friends, before we get into today's episode, I have a quick word. I know you've been frustrated with being confident in how to tell the difference between hearing from God and wondering if it's your own voice. Listen, I know, I've been there myself. That's why I wrote the Bible study, She Hears, Learning to Listen to Jesus. This is a six-week study that takes you through the book of John, looking at six women in the life of Jesus. It also teaches the color method of Bible study, which helps you to learn how to really understand the scriptures. I include lots of cultural and historical information, and it really makes these familiar passages of scripture just come alive. This is a great study to do on your own, to do with some girlfriends or even some teenage girls, and it will help you really gain the confidence in how to hear from the Lord and set you up with some tools that will stay with you long after the study is over. You can find that on my resources page at shehears.org. And for a limited time, I'm offering all of my podcast listeners a special discount of 20% off. You can use the discount code hearing Jesus that's one word all caps to get your discount there are also some free videos and a leader's guide for you to get started again head to shehears.org and you can find the bible study on the resources page hey friends welcome back to the hearing Jesus podcast I'm your host Rachel Grohl we are continuing today is day two where we are studying Mary and this devotional time is based out of the She Hears Bible study. And again, you can get that on my website. And this is just little glimpses of some of the things that we study in that Bible study. So I'm going to go ahead and read John chapter two, verses one through 11. And you will notice throughout this whole week, we are going to stay on the same passage of scripture and we will all, all week. And that's how the format of this Bible study works all every week. You will stay on the same passage and study it in depth, instead of plowing through and not understanding, we're going to meditate and really study God's word so it can change us from the inside out. At the end of the week on Saturday, every week there will be a weekly wrap up. And that episode talks about this method more in detail. But I want you to start getting into the practice of meditating in God's word. And that's why we do it this way. And you will notice that I use different translations depending on the week, depending on the day to help you broadening your um, opportunity for learning from different translations. So John chapter 2, 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for Jewish custom of purification, containing 20 to 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water, which had become wine, and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, Every man serves the the good wine first, and when the people have drunk freely, then he serves the poorer wine, but you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning... This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. So yesterday we took a look at Mary within this context of her role and her relationship with Jesus. And today we're going to take a look at the setting that we find our story, just this context of of the historical and the cultural setting. It says on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. So remember, this is the first miracle that we see in the scriptures that Jesus does, at least in public. Um, I think it is significant 
that it is a wedding. So weddings within the culture of Jesus' time were a little bit different than how we celebrate today. Weddings were basically a week-long feast. And so many of the close friends and family, all of those people and all of the extended families would be invited to come and celebrate. And so the fact that this wedding is being held in Cana, it's a small area of Galilee, it tells us that there was most likely a personal connection between the family of Jesus and the family of the bride or the groom. And so it says that the mother of Jesus was there, both Jesus and the disciples were invited to the wedding. Because John does refer to Mary as first, being present first, and then adds the detail that Jesus and the disciples were also there, we realize that probably both Jesus and Mary both had this personal connection to the family. And maybe Mary was there out of obligation, or maybe she was serving, or perhaps she, I kind of envision it, that she was like this beloved woman that many were in relationship with, and she was invited to kind of come celebrate as a close family friend. Jesus had not yet begun his public ministry, so he was likely there out of family obligation or even an obligation to his mom um, or just a community obligation because of the relationship he had with him. But the point is, is this is not some anonymous couple. At least on some levels, there was a personal concern about this, this new young marriage. And so when we think about weddings and marriage, I guess in light of this broader context of the entirety of scripture, remember we talked about that yesterday, we realize that weddings throughout scripture hold significant value. In the Old Testament, we see weddings as a picture of this relationship between God and Israel. And then in the New Testament, we see weddings as a picture of this relationship between Christ and the church. So think about what we said yesterday. Jesus does not do anything without intention. Everything he does is intentional. And so the setting that he chose to reveal his very first miracle, at least to those that are serving, it is not unintentional that he chose to do it at a wedding. And that's going to be important as we go throughout the week. But then we come to Mary's words. The first words we see Mary speak in this narrative is, they have no wine. And it's interesting because that can at first glance seem flippant or like she's complaining or, you know, there's something that she's trying to pressure Jesus to do. And like we mentioned before, I want you to get some perspective. These feasts could last for a week and and there's usually an untold number of guests because with the extended families coming, they can kind of guess, but this was not the the days of, uh, you know, a quick phone call or a text message. This is really hard to predict exactly how many people were going to come. So they did their best guess to guess how much wine they were going to need. But still, even even though they did this all the time, there was this ambiguity on the, the exact amount of what they were going to need. But the unwritten rule of the culture was that if they ran out of wine, it would bring shame onto their family. And so what I think we see happening here is Mary understanding that because she had a personal connection to this family, remember, this act of running out of wine would bring disgrace upon the groom and this new marriage. And so what Mary saw was somebody that she cared about, somebody she had personal concern for in this place where they were getting ready to be disgraced. And I'm sure, as probably most of you can attest, um, that probably brought some fear or some anxiety or some worry on the behalf of the people that she cared about, because that's what we do as women. And so fear and anxiety and concern, what do we see Mary do with those emotions? She brings them to Jesus. They have no wine. She didn't need to explain to Jesus why she was concerned. He knew. But that's the thing about Jesus. He always knows. And our job is not to explain to Jesus all the reasons that we're upset when things go wrong. Our job is to bring those things to him. There's so much to unpack there. But what I want you to do is I want you to bring it to him. Because he knows. He always knows. And then this is our heart check for today. Is there an area of your life that you were hesitant to bring to Jesus? Or when you do, it's accompanied by like this justification and this explanation of that's what I do. All these reasons why we have all these thoughts or feelings. That's not what we see Mary do. Mary's ability to take her concern to Jesus speaks something to us. 
And I want you to take a few minutes, if you need it, for your heart check to let the Lord reveal something to you as you think about this. Are there areas in your own life that you need to take to Jesus? Maybe you've been afraid to take those things to Jesus. Friend, he already knows. He always knows. Go ahead and pause it if you need to, because that's what this is about, is taking these things to Jesus. Now, if your heart is clear, I want to look at just a couple more things for us to think about today. After Mary takes her concern to Jesus, I want you to pay careful attention to how he responds to her and how he responds to us. He says, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. And at first glance, it's like, ouch, man, that's not what I expected. I expected Jesus to be like, hey, all right, we got it. And at first response, that feels like it stings a little because if we aren't careful, we'll take our own opinion of this interaction and kind of interpret it based on our lens instead of the lens of what actually happened. Because remember, it's important to read it as through the lens of the original audience and the original writer. And so I have often thought, okay, well, Jesus is just putting her in her place. And I think I've heard that taught a lot of times. But when Mary comes to Jesus with her concern, it's a valid reason. And Jesus knows that. What we see him doing is he is responding. He is not reacting. So when Jesus calls Mary woman, that is not a sign of disrespect as it would be in our culture. Like if my kids call me woman, I mean, that is disrespectful. And I mean, they won't or they better not. But that in that culture, the way that that translates is him calling her dear one. And we see this a couple different places in scripture, but he's saying dear one. And that simple detail changes the tone of this conversation from like rebuff to one of respect. The response that Jesus gives her, it is a term of respect when he says that, but it's also doing something. It's a shift in their relationship that we see for the first time. So for many years, we talked about this yesterday. Mary was an authority in the life of Jesus. Um, and after Joseph's death, she was likely one of the only authorities in the life of Jesus. And so because mothers were responsible for the spiritual formation of their kids and, and their behavior, teaching Jesus the Torah as his mother, often her authority over him dictated his response. And what was likely happening is she was expecting that when she took her concern to him, he would respond because that's a clear picture of the relationship. Except now we're at a turning point because Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. And so what does this mean? This means that now Jesus is responding to God's authority in his life as the only authority. And the timing and the will of the father is now taking precedence over Mary's will. The role and the responsibility that was given to Mary by God was also taken away by God. And I want you to think about that for a minute. Mary has to transfer her authority. And what does she do? She surrenders. She says, okay, whatever he says to you, do it. That's her direction. I don't know that I have responded with that kind of grace. In fact, my teenager is getting ready to go to college soon, and I definitely know I'm not responding with that kind of grace. But I want you to take some time to reflect on what this means in your own life. How have you handled seasons where your authority was coming to an end? And are you in that season right now? Some of us are. But how can you recognize it when you are? And when God calls us to lay something down, are we obedient the way that Mary is? When we get the answer that we don't expect. When we get a response that we don't expect. Mary shows up with this example, this incredible example of faith and surrender. Because when Jesus speaks his authority to her, she hears. Even when we don't know the answer or the outcome, we can trust the one that does. God, I pray for my friends today that if, if they are struggling with laying down authority or surrendering something to you, Lord God, I pray that you would intervene in such a way that they would not only trust you, but they would respond in faith and obedience. Lord God, I thank you for the example we see in Mary. I pray that throughout our day, as we meditate on your word, that you would remind us that you know. 
that you always know. Thank you, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey friends, if this podcast helped encourage, empower, or equip you for God's call in your life, I would love it if you would head over to Apple Podcasts and leave me a review. That's the number one way you can support my show. You can also join our free Facebook community or Instagram page where I share inspirational tips, resources, and prayer throughout the week. Hey, I want you to know I'm praying for you this week. Know that you are loved, you are cherished, and you are His.